right, this morning we're going to be looking at the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 forward. So if you have your Bible, open it up with me, or use your iPad, iPod, iPhone, whatever you got. Let us turn to Acts, chapter 2, 42 forward. That's where we're going to begin. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now what we have here is the very first report of the new church. Now earlier in this chapter, remember last week we celebrated Pentecost. The coming of the Spirit upon the 120 that were in the upper room. Then Peter got up and he spoke boldly to the crowd that accused them of being drunk. And so he preached to them and he shared with them the good news of Jesus, sharing uh, his life and his death and his resurrection. And on that day it says that 3,000 joined with them. And so now we see in verse 42, they, they referring to the 3,000 plus believers, they devoted themselves to the teachings of these apostles. They devoted to the fellowship, to communion, and to prayer. Now that word devoted is the key word here. Devoted means loyal, steadfast, committed, dedicated. The Greek word that's used here means to keep close, to hold close. So what we're seeing here is that these first believers held close the teachings of the apostles. They kept them close to their hearts, which makes sense. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And that's what these first believers were doing. They were allowing the teachings of the apostles to dwell within them richly. The apostles' teachings were central to their faith, and the apostles' teachings are central to our faith. Why? Because the apostles were eyewitnesses to everything Jesus did while he was here on earth. They were there when Jesus performed his miracles, his healings. They were there when Jesus was crucified on that cross. They were there to witness the empty tomb. They were there when Christ ascended into heaven. And they were the first to experience the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It is through this 120, it is through this 3,000 that the new church would emerge. The church is being born right here. The apostles' teachings are central to our faith. They were hearers. They were doers. They didn't just hear the word. They embraced it. They participated. They allowed the word to move them. And we get an indication of that here when it says that the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone that had need. There was action. There was response. They were devoted individuals. The first century church was on fire for God. Now is this how we would describe the 21st century church? Would we describe the 21st century church as a church that is on fire for God? Some might say yes, because you know, they don't want to admit or they don't want to acknowledge that the 
church has slowed down quite a bit. But I read a recent poll that was done about a year or so ago uh, about how people viewed the church today. And in this poll, it said that many view the church today as lazy, apathetic, self-centered. In this poll, these people believe that Christians, and this poll included believers, that Christians have no sense of urgency to reach the lost. This poll showed that many believed that the church was more concerned about survival than about fulfilling the mission of God. Now this is a sad but a scary commentary about the church today. How people view the church. But I believe the church can be on fire for God. I think First Christian Church is definitely moving and responding to the call of God. As a church, as a whole, I think we can become on fire for God again if we embrace the four truths of God found here in 42. Devoting ourselves to the teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So write this down. God's Word is inspired and perfect. God's Word is inspired and perfect. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is God-breathed. Psalm 1830 God's way is perfect. His Word is flawless. So if you're somebody who lives for coming to church every Sunday and looking at the bulletin and finding those mistakes, <laughs> guess what? You're going to find them. In fact, there's one in there today at the Bible study. You're going to find them. Why? Because I'm human. I'm human. The bulletins are made with the hands of humans. Gina is human. God bless her. Gina is human. <laughs> She's going to make mistakes. I don't know how many times she walks out of my office and says, I'm going to close the door now so I won't bother you anymore. Two seconds later, I'm sorry. <laughs> Am I right, Gina? Yeah, yeah. And that's when I fire her. And I rehire her. Human hands. But God's Word was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is perfect. And every word is God breathed and it is useful. Now I don't get it. I, I don't get how people can neglect one of the greatest gifts that God has given us in His Word. The Bible, comprised by 40 different people, comprised over the course of 1,600 years, three different languages, on three different continents. And yet from the first pages of Genesis to the end of Revelation, every word points and moves us into one direction. And it points us to Jesus Christ. All of it. The Bible contains promises, blessings, gifts, but you have to open it. You have to read it. You have to allow God to speak to you through it. We have to devote ourselves to the apostles' teachings. They were there. We have to devote ourselves. Second, write this down. God's Word judges our thoughts and our actions. God's Word judges our thoughts and our actions. This is a tough truth, but it's a truth nonetheless. You know, I've met people who, uh, who they know the truths of God. They know the truths of God, yet they choose to ignore those truths. I know people who know what's, uh, what goes against God, yet they choose to do those things anyway. Uh, I call those people cafeteria Christians. You're laughing. Is that because you uh, relate to that? No. Cafeteria Christians. Those are the people who go through the buffet line of God's Word, and they pick and choose what suits them, and then they reject 
what does not suit them. I'm going to believe this and accept this, but I don't like this, so I'm going to pretend like it doesn't exist. Picking and choosing out of God's Word. But you know, God will judge us not based on what we think is right or wrong, what we think is good or bad. God's going to judge us based on what lines up with His will. You know, I, I mean, a lot of people who have a problem with that, I understand that. It's tough. It's not easy. But God is a righteous God. God is a righteous God. And that means that God cannot allow sin to go without being dealt with. It has to be dealt with because He is a fair and just God. It's tough. And I think it's amazing how, you know, we just, our, our fourth, got, got a permit. And I think it's amazing how we will study and study and study to learn the laws of the land. You know, I want to drive, so I'm going to, I'm going to study that book, a driver's ed book, and I'm going to, you know, when I was in high school, we had simulators. You remember, of course, you know, I know some of you are older than I am, but I remember simulators. You remember simulators? No. Yes. No. <laughs> Amen. Somebody's awake, praise God. Amen. <laughs> simulators. I remember in class, I'd be, we, they would take us into a room and they'd have a film projector, one of those old reel to reel film projectors, and they would show a movie. And the movie was, uh, looked like you're driving down the street. And then everybody had their own little car and they had to steer. And each car was connected to a computer and it would record your reactions based on where it was in the film. Probably high technology at that point, I don't know. But little kids would run out the road and you'd have to push on the brake. A uh, car would pull out, you'd have to turn the steering wheel. And it would uh, record whether you hit the kid, whether you hit the car. And boy, all of us in that class, I mean, we wanted to make sure we were perfect because we wanted our license. And we studied and we studied and we studied and we studied so that we could get our license. It's amazing how we'll do that. We'll study the law of the land. Why? Well, Pastor Kurt, I don't want to get pulled over, I don't want to get a ticket, and I don't want to have to face a judge. What about the ultimate judge? What about the eternal judge? We're more scared to judge Judy than we are of God. We're more worried about having to face the earthly judge than we are about what God's reaction is going to be when we stand before him. Romans, where is that at? Romans 14, 12. Each of us will give an account of our lives to God. There's no surprises here. No tricks. Yet some of us will go before God, and God's going to go, all right, now let's uh, give an account of your life. Oh, really? I didn't think you were serious. I left that off a buffet. We're going to have to give an account of our lives to God. If we want to return to the days of fire, to the days of power, it's got to start with the teachings of the apostles. It's got to start with this. The news of Christ. The teachings of Christ. The life of Christ. Faith comes by hearing. This is where we start. Devoting ourselves to the apostles' teachings. The apostles who were there during the life, the death, and the life of Christ. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Blessings are found inside this book. But we have to open it. And we have to devote ourselves to it. So I want to leave you with one thought. This is the one thought I want you to meditate upon when you leave here. When you go out for lunch and you start talking about how Pastor Kurt's sermon was all messed up, this is the verse, or not the verse, but the thought that I want you to meditate on. How can you stand on the promises of God if you don't know what the promises are? How can you stand on the promises of God if you do not know His promises?